Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're at Coconut Island on Oahu to check out the latest in shark and tuna tagging research. We'll get to see hammerhead and reef sharks as we investigate the types of high-tech tags used for tracking these predators. We'll beta test a new shark repellent technology to see if it can help reduce the number of unwanted shark catches on commercial fishing hooks. We'll feed a shark, we'll catch a shark, we'll tag a shark, and we'll talk shark behavior right now on Voice of the Sea. I studied at Coconut Island from 1999 to 2005 and earned my master's and PhD with Dr. Kim Holland, studying the biology, growth, and movement of hammerhead sharks. I was excited to head out to Coconut Island and see firsthand how the research has progressed. Okay, Melanie, the Holland Lab is well known for tagging and tracking of Mm. all different kinds of organisms from octopus to reef fish to big tunas to sharks and you're carrying on that tradition yeah tell me what exciting things are happening now so we've kind of exhausted our tiger shark work and so we're moving on to different animals and right now we're looking at um, scalloped hammerhead sharks their movements once they leave the bay we know a lot about what the pups are doing here in the bay. There's been a lot of work on the ecology and the growth and so now we're trying to figure out what where they're coming from and where they're going and what they're doing. People have had a really hard time getting tags on adult hammerhead sharks and so they're really hard to catch because the females are coming in here to pup so they're not eating so we can't hook them. Uh-huh. And a lot of other groups have been diving to pole tag them in the water sure and we have been fishing for them for four years and we've caught seven I remember (laughs) spending the night out at this island with my colleague Aaron Bush trying to catch adult hammerheads to put tags on a decade ago so I'm really excited to hear what you found out so we actually are just now starting to analyze the first results that we're getting back from some of our satellite tags And so we've been actually triple tagging all of the animals that we get. And so a combination of acoustic tags. So these are the um, the V the Vimco coated pingers that we actually implant in the animals. And then they get picked up on our um, acoustic array that we have around the entire Hawaiian archipelago. And so we get real time movements of their or I guess it's not real time. We figure it out when we go and we download the receiver. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Of their movements around the islands and offshore because we have the receivers on the fads, but we're also putting two different types of satellite tags on them. So we have these mini pad satellite tags that um, are archival tags. And so they, they have an onboard computer, so they're actually recording and binning the data, and they pop off. They have a guillotine right here, and they pop off at a pre-designated time. After they pop off, the transmitters can be retrieved if they are close to shore or if they wash up on the beach. And then we also have these other satellite tags, and these we put, we um, drill into the dorsal fin of the animal, And so these things are called spot tags. They're smart position or temperature transmitting tags. And so what these do is they have a wet dry sensor. And so as soon as the animal breaks the surface, Uh it can tell that it's dry and it's time to transmit. And so it gives, this actually gives you a real time, hello, here I am, kind of a thing. So you get actual position data. Wow. Yeah. These are new. These are new. Mini pads are new. These are the mini pads and um, has a little bit more sophisticated uh, machinery on it. And it's the newer version of this tag. This tag is called the Mark 10. These are all wildlife computer tags. 
The Mark 10 does the same thing, but in this version, it's obviously a lot smaller. And we worry about that because um, these things create a lot of drag on the animals, and sharks have been around for, what, 400 million years? You know, they've spent a lot of time getting kind of streamlined. And so something like this creates a lot of drag, and it actually, we think that they pop off early, because that is one of the problems that we have, because of the drag. We think it actually sometimes might pull out of the animal. Uh -huh. and so we're trying to find new ways to um, reduce that. At the indoor shark tank, Melanie shows us her behavior trials. They're designed to repel sharks from baited hooks. She wants to know if electropositive metals can actually stop sharks from biting. Can you talk to me a little bit about what you're doing? Yeah, actually these were some behavior trials that were meant to mimic what we were doing in the field. Uh -huh. This project is a um, shark bycatch mitigation project. And so we're looking at different strategies to reduce the incident of the unwanted take of sharks in longline fisheries. And so because sharks have these sensitive electrosensory systems that teleos sharks don't, or teleos fishes don't have, which are the targeted fish in um, longline fisheries, we thought that if you used something that would maybe overwhelm their electrosensory apparatus, it would selectively deter sharks from these longline baits. So what is it that you've added to the long line configuration that, that you think might deter the sharks? So what we have above here on these lines is um, electropositive metals. They're from the lanthanide series of the periodic table of the elements. And this is an alloy of praseodymium and neodymium. Oh my gosh, those are elements that I don't, I honestly yeah, don't they, really know about. They, people, um, they're being used to make batteries and um, they're mined in China mostly, but um, they give off electrons readily. And so they create this, well, they react with water and they give off electrons and they create this electrochemical field around them. And it's a really strong electric field. And so the sharks can pick up on it. And so what we're trying to look at here is whether or not the sharks are actually repelled from a bait using these things. And so we're doing these paired trials. They're done in twos so that we I see. have the electropositive metal on one bait and then a control, which is an inert lead weight. And so you kind of rule out whether or not it's a visual stimulus that is repelling them away from the bait as opposed to the actual electrochemical cue. And there's no hook on this. There's no hook. Yeah, I don't want to hook these animals. We're just going to see which bait, which bait they, they like better. Prefer. Yeah. And you're hypothesizing that, that they're not going to like that one as much because it's creating this magnetic field around the squid. Exactly. OK. Should we go for it? Yeah. OK. What do we do? So let's, um, they, the sharks are kind of excited right now. So let's um, feed this out kind of quickly and see which bait they go after. So you have the... This is the electropositive metal, so this bait will be further out. And this is the one with the lead. That's right. Okay. Ready? Ready. So sometimes it takes them a couple minutes to get um, attracted to the feeding stimulus. There we go. Did you oh, see that? Oh, I did. There right. he goes, there he goes. Oh, and he got it. The shark ate the squid, which was attached to the lead weight, and left the squid, which was attached to the electropositive metals, alone, further supporting Melanie's hypothesis, and hopefully one day leading to less shark bycatch. You're watching Voice of the Sea. Next, we head over to talk with world-renowned shark expert, Dr. Carl Meyer, and learn more about acoustic tags and how they are revolutionizing our understanding of shark biology and behavior. So I know today you've heard something about acoustic tags and acoustic receivers and their uses for um, quantifying the movements of fishes and sharks. So I thought I'd show you a different type of receiver one with uh, using which you can actually hear the signal from the transmitter. Very good. And that will help the viewers to understand exactly how this system works. So here I have a large ultrasonic acoustic tag of the type we put inside big sharks. It's the coded variety, so it has a system a bit like Morse code that allows us to 
um, determine exactly which individual it was swimming past our particular receiver. So what I'm going to do is I have this I have this receiver here that's hooked up to a directional hydrophone. A hydrophone is basically an underwater microphone. And the hydrophone will detect the signal from the transmitter. And the receiver, this type of receiver, is basically a device that, tra that translates the signal from the ultrasonic range, which is well above human hearing, into the audible range. So if I go ahead and I switch this unit on, then touch the hydrophone, you can hear that uh -huh. the hydrophone is live. And then if I go ahead and I, and I pull off this small magnet, which will activate this tag, and put it up next to the put it up next to the hydrophone, you can hear it starting to beep. Now you can hear, it, hear that there's a series of beeps there that are not evenly spaced, and we refer to that as a pulse train. And if you look at the little display, you can see that there's this number here, 50327, and that is the unique identification code for this particular transmitter. Now this device, again, is attached to the outside of the shark. It collects information from various sensors on the depth and the water temperature and also the light levels that the shark is experiencing as it swims through the ocean. And then at a predetermined time and date, there's a tiny little burn pin you can see on the end of the tag. Mm -hmm. And a little alarm clock goes off inside the tag and a current is put through the pin which makes it corrode and then this entire thing comes off the shark, floats up to the ocean surface and there it sits and uploads all of the stored information to the overhead satellite array which we're then able to retrieve remotely and reconstruct information on the shark's swimming depth, the water temperatures that it experienced and also create a course track of where it went in the ocean using the light levels. So I'm, I'm now programming this tag so that the various sensors it has on board will collect information at one second intervals to provide a very, very high resolution picture of the environment inside the shark's stomach. And this tag, Carl, you were saying is experimental. It's not commercially available on That's the correct. market. That's so, correct. So this is a prototype tag and we've been working with the manufacturers to develop and refine this particular tag so that down the road it may become commercially available if it's very successful as a, as a feeding tag. But for the time being, this is the only one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're very lucky then to get to see it in action. Indeed. Now this tag has already spent several weeks in shark stomachs. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so it's been eaten and regurgitated a couple of times already. In fact... <laughs> Delicious. It smells like a fish. <laughs> yes, just like a fish. Okay, so we plug it in. We need a little magnet to wake it up. You can see if I sweep the magnet, you should see a little uh, oh, yep. flashing light to indicate that it's awake. I'm going to go ahead and put the little plug in and then we're going to go down and hopefully feed it to one of our captive sharks. So here I have a nice Pacific mackerel which is going to act as the Trojan horse for this feeding tag. So what I'm hoping to do is take this very large tag and put it inside this fish and completely conceal it so we can then go ahead and feed it to one of our sharks. So I literally just take it, push it down inside the fish, well done. Okay, that's inside the fish's body. <laughs> it's a bit I'm, turgid now. I'm going to trim a little bit off the tail of this fish just to make it less of a of a mouthful for the um, for the shark. There we go. I'm going to attach a small piece of monofilament line that will just break free when the shark hopefully takes the mackerel. And that way you'll be able to pull it if somebody else is trying yes, to eat it. Yes, moray eels, 
reef fishes that are supposedly herbivorous, all the rest of it. Okay. So this um, is one of our outdoor holding facilities where we're able to keep a variety of coastal sharks. Um, in this particular pen at the moment we have sandbar sharks and we also have some scalloped hammerheads. Okay, so we have an adult sandbar shark in here that we're going to try and feed the tag to. Sandbar sharks are one of the common coastal species in Hawaiian waters and uh, they've been the, uh, an important test species for our prototype tags. In this bin here I have some tunas and some bloody water. I'm going to put some of the juice into the water to hopefully get the sharks interested. We can see the little hammerheads have smelt the blood and hopefully the larger sharks will also um, pick up the scent and come on over. So we just saw the big sandbar. I'm going to go ahead and lower the mackerel down. After many attempts, the sandbar shark finally took the bait and swallowed the transmitter. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. I was excited to catch up with Dave Itano. Dave is one of the most knowledgeable tuna experts, not just in Hawaii, but throughout the Pacific. When I was in grad school, I had the chance to help Dave with his research, tuna tagging, and setting up monitoring stations. For this episode, I got to visit Dave on board in his boat, the OPA, to learn about his new research. It's been a while since you've been on the OPA. Huh? Dave, it's been so long since I've been on the OPA, it's not even the same color. You guys have painted it, and there's lots of new work going on. Yeah, we're doing a lot of new things. Um, moving on, we're still doing a lot of tagging. So every fish we tag gets a dart tag. Uh -huh. And it's dart, like in a playing darts. Okay. Yeah. And that's just a simple plastic tag that you have to use this stainless steel applicator. And the tag is inserted. And that's inserted in the fish. And this locks between the bones that run down from the fin. Uh -huh. So once it's done that way, you can feel it actually click into place. You pull this out and reuse these, and this will stay in the fish for the life of the fish, if you do it correctly. This is very important because this is the only um, sign that a fisherman sometimes has that this fish is a, is might have uh, other instruments in it that are inside the, the body cavity. And on the, on the tag, there's a number, unique number, and it says reward and a 1-800 phone number. When we mark or tag a fish, you measure it, and you, you record the species, where you did it, tagged it, and released it, and um, the date. 
course. And if fishermen catch these and return it to us, then and, and they give us the same information, we can get growth data, uh -huh. movement data, simple movement data. It's only from where you let it go to where someone caught it, how they caught it, where they caught it. Um, all that information goes into the database. And, and this is still the best way to um, this is still the best way to ground truth the big stock assessment models. So I'm still involved in large-scale tagging projects where we tag hundreds of thousands of tuna. And what and species of tuna are you mostly tagging? We're, I concentrate on the tropical tunas, meaning the skipjack, the yellowfin, and the, and the big eye. Nice yellowfin tuna. Can you show me the difference how I could recognize this as a yellowfin versus a big eye? Big eye tuna um, have a much deeper body and have a more rounded appearance in a profile. Yellowfin tuna, that, that pectoral fin at this size, it's kind of, kind of thick on the end. A big eye at this size will have a very, very thin pointed pectoral fin and a bit longer. The head will be bigger on a, yellow, a big eye than the yellowfin. And this is a feature that I use. See that sort of V pattern? Mm -hmm. That's very, very characteristic. All yellowfin have it at, at all sizes. And the big eye is more of a flat or a crescent sort of across there without these bulges. You see these little bulges here? I do. Yeah, that's, big eye don't have that. It's flat and then flat across the back. The coloration, typically the yellow fin has a yellow tail, yellowish. The big eye is black. I'll show you the tagging. Fork length is the straight measurement between the tip of the snout when it's closed to this point right here, the fork of the tail. Not, not kind of curved over the body, but straight. And then your tagging area, tagging area will be right here below the second dorsal fin. Because that fin is anchored into the, the whole body with little, little rays that go down. So you want to tag it anywhere from here to here with the dart facing backwards like that. Mm -hmm. And as you press it in, you'll, it'll go on the other side of those fins, uh, fin rays an anchor. Thanks for watching Voice of the Sea. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years. Through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. Teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Kosi Island Earth is working to establish new avenues for connecting research scientists with educators and communities. Kosi Island Earth is working to enhance the science and ocean literacy of our island residents and visitors. Kosi Island Earth is working to connect scientific research, traditional knowledge, and ocean policy. Kosi Island Earth, bringing together university, government, research, and community partners to enhance ocean literacy and engage all ocean users in stewardship.